Good evening, everybody. Uh, it kind of feels a little bit like from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, my, name is, uh, my name is Richard Potter. I am a CTO for Microsoft Services Business in the UK, which for the purposes of this presentation is completely irrelevant because my passion really is about finding new and interesting ways to talk about tech. I love tech. I love telling stories about tech. And the more creative, dare I say, the more diverse and inclusive we can get in telling those stories, I am happier still. So, you look absolutely terrified. <laughs> I need you to help me tell this story. I need you to help me tell this story incredibly breathlessly because this story normally gets done in about 40 minutes. We're going to do it in about 18 you're literally like coiled springs, aren't we? Um, ladies and gentlemen, I give you AI's well that ends well. Can you see what I've done there? Brilliant. So the whole subtext here is, what can the great bard Shakespeare tell us about the effect of bias on diversity and inclusion? So here we are. All the world's a stage. There's a message in here because... Guess what a stage needs? It needs actors. And guess who is going to be doing the acting tonight? No, 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 not me. <laughs> you. Okay? It's inclusive. So I'm going to encourage you to be very much part of this story. But hold back. Wait. You'll get your chance in a moment. Okay. So let's start with AI and bias. We're all in the same place on this. Far, far deeper experts on this topic have been before me on this, so we can canter through this very quickly. But the importance I want us to get hold of is, is the fact that bias, for our purposes, for our story, is really about dysfunction, what happens when things go wrong. Okay, and why is it so important when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion? Well, what we really want to be able to do in all of our great organizations that we work with is do brilliant, new, innovative things. And in order to do brilliant, new, innovative things, we need to challenge the status quo. We need to bring fresh thinking, not just go down the same old rabbit holes we've always done. We need diversity in that thinking. We need spontaneity, and we need to drive creativity in everything that we can do. We need to experiment loads, as Amy said. We need to fail quickly and move through those problems. And fundamentally, we need to make sure that the end product that we deliver, this great AI that we're pursuing, is AI for all. It's AI for everybody, not just these tight little demographics that we might run to. And Shakespeare. And why Shakespeare? Why Shakespeare? Why, why would we... Well, why wouldn't we? Because what we've learned very clearly this evening is, is that most of the bias, most of the dysfunction that we get through AI is from us as flawed human beings about the way that we make sense of the world around us. And who better to expose us to the stories of flawed human beings Good old Bill. He's going to help us through this. Okay, so um, William Shakespeare, absolutely deep, steeped in diversity and inclusion. All of the stories that he tells tell this rich panoply of, of culture, interactions across deep society, and we're going to rip through that as quickly as we can today. Um, conveniently, to help us along this canter, I've done some stage notes just to keep us on the straight and narrow. So just when you think he's gone off on some luxurious tangent, one of these will appear and keep us in the right place. We're going to talk about three types of bias. We're going to talk about pre-existing bias. We're going to talk about technical bias. We're going to talk about emergent bias. Okay? And what we need for three different types of bias is three different types of stories. So let's look first at pre-existing bias through the lens of Twelfth Night. Okay, here's that moment, everybody. I need four actors, four people that are willing to help me tell this story. If I don't get volunteers, I'm going to come and find you. Yes, please, you two, out here, please. Here we come. Um, could you come over here? 
Um, let's come over here. Let's stand over here. I need two more. Um, in fact, could I have another male and, uh, and another female? But we're, we're, we're happy. Yes, we're happy. Um, yes, we're happy to say that. That's brilliant. Okay, here we go. Right. So, let's go into the story of Twelfth Night. Anyone familiar with the works of Shakespeare? Well, if you thought you were familiar, forget it all because I'm going to retell it my way. Okay, here we go. Twelfth Night, the lovely story of a couple of twins. Here we are. We've got um, uh, Sebast Sebastian and Viola, and they're twins, and they're on a sailing boat, and they're going through the ocean, and oh my goodness, the ship gets wrecked, and the twins get separated. So if you can go over there, Sebastian, and Viola, if you can stand over here. Um, we need some costumes for these actors, I think. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, in fact, no, hold on to that one for the moment. We'll keep that one for the moment. But, Sebastian, you, you're very clearly dashing in your Elizabethan garb there. Um, and here's Viola shipwrecked on, this, on this, this shore here. Now, she's shipwrecked on this island called Illyria. You're a natural, absolutely gifted. She's shipwrecked on the island of Illyria, and there is a Duke of Illyria called the Duke Orsino. Um, so let's have the Duke Orsino here. And the Duke Orsino needs a big, proud hat. There we go. The Duke Orsino, there we have him. Um, now, um, while Viola is trying to find her brother, she needs to keep herself busy and wants to get gainfully employed, so she wants to enter into the service of Duke Orsino. Now, back in the day, it was quite hard for a young lady rocking up on an island to get a job, so she finds it necessary to make herself look like a bloke. And there she is. Absolutely stunning, isn't it? Amazing transformation there. Now, not only does she dress up like a bloke, but she takes quite a shine to our Duke Orsino. There we go. Fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. However, there is another character on this island here. <laughs> the Countess Olivia. Here we are. Now, um... We've gone to great lengths with the costume department here. Uh, we've got an Olivia Newton-John wig for the Countess <laughs> Olivia. There we go. <laughs> it's Brilliant. Now, the interesting thing about the Countess Olivia is, is that the Countess Olivia has caught the eye of the Duke of Orsino. So, unfortunately, the Duke of Orsino is clearly not interested in Viola, but is very attracted to... Steady, steady. Let's keep this... Uh, it's before 9 o'clock, thank you. Um, okay, so there we go. I mean, what brilliant, just freeze the story there. If you can stay there for the moment. Okay, let's just, we've got with Sebastian shipwrecked in the oblivion. We've got uh, Viola here dressed as a bloke, actually now called Cesario, who takes a bit of a shine to Orsino, but Orsino's not interested. Orsino's more interested in the Countess Olivia. There we go. So, what do we know about this? Well, what we can see in this story is the beginnings of some pre-existing bias. So, Shakespeare's already unpacking these things for us. We can see gender stereotyping very clearly. And we can also see this very insular view throughout this play of the, the island of Illyria, where Orsino lives, is very isolated. There's all kinds of preconceptions that, that mean that this, this world gets madder and madder and madder as we go through it. Okay, um, and we saw this kind of thing in the, the example that Alison gave earlier with the Amazon recruitment process. Those preconceptions, those gender stereotypings that lead to people favoring a particular gender, that retrenched island view of we're right, we're a big conceited big tech company, we're the people that make all of the right decisions. It's exactly mirrored in the world that we can see on the island of Illyria in Twelfth Night. Okay. So, let's look at what Shakespeare can tell us about the resolution of this problem. So, we're going to roll the story forwards here. Okay, well, it all gets a little bit mad, and there's a whole load of hilarity in this story here. But one of the craziest things that happens is good old Sebastian turns up on the island. My goodness me. My goodness me. Well, so there we go. And... Um, what happens with here is, is that, in the meantime, Olivia has taken quite a shine to Viola, now known as Cesario. But when Sebastian turns up, Olivia gets all confused and thinks that Sebastian is Cesario. 
So there's a nice little teaming up that happens over there, at which point Viola reveals herself to Orsino, and we get happiness over here. So we get complete happiness. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you just give a big, big bow and a big flourish. There we go. And if you give your little props back to Ben there. Um, I'm hugely talented, and thank you so much for helping me tell the story so far. So what we can see here is, is that perhaps if we'd begun this story with a little bit of a broad-minded narrative at the beginning, we'd had a little bit more inclusive design in the way that we thought this whole thing through, and we'd actually thought about the consequences of what was going to happen, we would have got to that resolution more swiftly at the end of it. Are you with me on this? We've got two more to do. Okay, fantastic. Brilliant. So we're going to do technical bias now here. Um, technical bias is all about what happens when things are just fundamentally wrong. So you've either got a major problem in terms of the data set that you're using or the algorithm that you've designed is just plain mad. So where should we go with this one? Well, let's go to Hamlet, because Hamlet is all about madness, isn't it? It's about the madness of Prince Hamlet and his understanding of the world. I need three actors this time. Three actors. Um, come on, let's go. Anyone willing, able, keen, terrified? Uh, come on up, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you're going to make a really good Gertrude. Come over here. Over here. Um, oh, really? Okay, brilliant. Let's have a couple more, please. Otherwise, I might have to pick. Come on, gentlemen, over here, please. Here we are. I think you make a really good Hamlet, actually. Oh, and another one at the back here, please. Let's have one up here. Um, right, okay. So everyone knows the story of Hamlet, don't we? Everyone knows what goes on here. So here we go. The story is of a Prince Hamlet. Here he is. We need a prop for Prince Hamlet. Ah, oh, it had to be. It had to be. Um, Hamlet meet Yorick. Yorick meet Hamlet. Here we go. Here we go. So here we have Prince Hamlet. Um, and Prince Hamlet gets news of the fact that his father, King Hamlet, has died. So returns back to Denmark, only to be informed by a ghost when he gets back to Denmark that actually the suspect is Claudius, the brother of the old King Hamlet, and Claudius, um, hang on, has also taken a shine to Hamlet's mother, Gertrude, okay? And has now shacked up together and usurped the crown, okay? So here we go. I apologize for this. I lost my crown props. So I've spent a good part of the morning cutting up Shreddy's boxes. Stylish. For Here we go. So if you can stand up here. Now, the, now the whole play here is, is that Hamlet is trying to make sense of the fact of, did this really happen? Was the ghost really true in the assertion that actually Claudius and Gertrude plotted to get away with his father and then usurp the crown? He goes to great lengths, and practically everybody in the entire story gets affected by Hamlet's madness as he goes through. Okay? So, uh, theatrical pause. Brilliant. All right, we've frozen the story there. It, it's amazing, this, isn't it? They're all equity card holders. You did know that, didn't you? So what we can see here in this, this instance of technical bias is, is that Shakespeare is showing us that actually the unsoundness of the mind that is making these decisions is creating all manner of chaos, unconstrained chaos that has unanticipated impact across many, many lives. And more importantly, there are many opportunities in the story of Hamlet where you as the member of the audience is sitting there going, oh, why can't he just see? Why can't you just understand that? This inability for Hamlet to learn throughout the story is what's propelling him to this almost cataclysmic end at the end of it. Um, and we see this in the compass story that Alison was introducing to us earlier. These famous stories see all of this that fundamentally, the way that Compass was designed, it was, was wrong. It, it, it's, it's just ineffective in terms of solving this problem of recidivism in, in, in public order. Um, so let's, let's go through this to the end. Well, I mean, you know what happens at the end of Hamlet. It goes all a little bit reservoir dogsy. 
everyone's stabbing each other, there's poison, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, if you just sort of fake a kind of a theatrical death, just... <laughs> Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Genius. Genius. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, brilliant. I mean, you, you, can, you can see where we get to with it. So what, what does Shakespeare tell us about how we can think this through? Well, let's test, the, let's test the machine. Let's try and establish whether this machine is actually fit for purpose. And then when we're testing it, can we put some telemetry into the machine itself, into that black box that Alison introduced us to, to give us a little bit more transparency so that we can understand whether there is soundness of mind in the algorithms that we're using. Okay, last one. Ready? Here we go. So we're going to go into, oh, I pressed black. Um, there we go. Emergent bias. My favorite Shakespeare's play. We're going to look at Temp the Tempest, his last play, the Bard's big denouement at the end of his, his theatrical life. Um, and we're going to need three characters for this. Who wants to be part of this one? Yes, very quick at the back. Two at the back there. Yes, we need one more. We need one more. Honestly, it's the best play ever. It's literally the best one ever. I'm not really selling it well enough, am I? Come on, one more. Ben, fantastic. Oh, Ben. Oh, you know where this is going now. You know where this is going now. Brilliant. Okay, so um, let's do a quick setup on the story of the Tempest. Um, right. First of all, on the island, we have got uh, Prospero. Um, so let's take this. So Prospero is the former um, Duke of, of Naples, and he's been put on a boat and he's been sent off and has been dispatched um, and in a storm shipwrecked on an island, okay? And has existed there for 12 years. During that time, has developed magical powers um, and has become a little bit of a cloak-wearing wizard. There we are. Um, and part of those magical powers have, become, have come from the discovery of a spirit that lives on the island. A spirit called Ariel. You up for this, Ben? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. So, Ariel... <laughs> Ariel is a magical spirit with fairy wings. Okay. Ariel, if you can come and stand here. There we go. Brilliant. So, Ariel is a, um, a magical spirit and enables Prospero to do all kinds of things on the island. Incredible things. Dare I say it, a fantastic metaphor for an all-powerful all AI. However, Ariel has also been under the influence of someone with more nefarious intent, which is a witch called Sycorax. There we are. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, so in fact, let's have Ariel in between the two because part of the story is about the tension between pulling Ariel to good and to bad. And Ariel actually begins in a very bad place and then gets pulled over to a good place, but then gets turned a little bit into a bad place. Let's freeze that there, very theatrically. Okay, fantastic. Brilliant. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing the manipulation of Ariel, and we're seeing Ariel, who is a generally um, innocent and naive bystander in the whole process, drifting into poor outcomes through the manipulation of others. Okay, so where do we see this? Well, I'm going to talk about Tay, even if Alison isn't, even if it is the elephant in the room. Because Tay, which was a chatbot that Microsoft developed and deployed through Twitter several years ago, got manipulated. We went out with incredibly good intent to try and engage humanity in deep, meaningful, and research-ridden conversations, but was manipulated into places that, quite frankly, Tay shouldn't have gone. Pretty awkward. Tay, interestingly, still lives on. Tay has grown up and now exists in its core in a chatbot that is deployed around the world, and particularly so in Southeast Asia, in the form of a chatbot called Zhao Ice. And it's out there exploring what we would call EQ rather than IQ. Because Tay slash Zhao Ice is a bot that is relentlessly a people pleaser. 
It's just there to try and develop an emotional connection with an audience. Very much as the pink fairy wearing, wearing Ariel was within the Tempest as well. Okay, so let's, um, let's roll this forward breathlessly to the resolution and understand what Shakespeare can tell us about this. Well, fortunately, Sycorax is dispelled from this and, and is drifted away. And what happens is, is that actually Prospero realizes the manipulation that he has done on, onto Ariel and very figuratively at the end of the play actually breaks Prospero. Can you do this with me, Prospero? So we're going to break your staff over your knee which is the staff that controlled Ariel and manipulated Ariel into those unhealthy outcomes that we really didn't want to get to. And as with many of Shakespeare's plays, there's a happy resolution with lots of weddings and happiness at the end of it. And a big flourishing bow from our performers. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Amazing. Okay, so um, what we saw there was, was that actually we can start to address this, uh, this bias by doing things like putting ongoing measurement in. So not just measuring it at the beginning and not just making sure that the design is correct, that you live through the life of this AI. Understanding that drift, understanding that manipulation as it goes through. And the other thing that, that this teaches us is the importance of having some accountability that sits around the AI. And when we deploy our horsepower that sits inside our cognitive services, we're not just looking at the technological environment that these, these AIs are going into. We're assessing whether the organizations that we're deploying them within have got strong accountability that can course correct when necessary in that space. Okay, brilliant. So there we go. I can't believe I've done this so quickly. Here we go. Three types of bias. Pre-existing bias, technical bias, and emergent bias. That's, what, that's at the core of what we're talking about when we talk about bias in AI. Um, and we remember its importance associated with these goals of diversity and inclusion that we're pursuing. Um, and it's deployed through the trust framework that uh, Pratim introduced us to at the beginning about the way that Microsoft itself is governing its own AI activities. But the important thing to get to at the end of it is, is that this is all about us. Because the subtext of me standing up here getting out of breath, waving my arms about, trying to tell creative ways of a very technical story is the pursuit of diversity and inclusion in itself. If we can only talk about AI in a technical language with reference to architecture diagrams and algorithms, we will never achieve what we need to achieve in this space. As we build the engineers, the computer scientists, but also the consumers of technology for the future, we need to reach out beyond our usual narrative forms, perhaps not always into the hilarity of putting pink fairy wings on people like Ben, but find new ways of telling these stories so that we can engage everybody in the development of this really important technology. Thank you very much.